12, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, and we have a very exciting session now, which is um, going to be led by some of our young people who are here and who will be leading. I've, had a, I've heard a lot of complaints about all the Reverend Doctors, so there's not a single Reverend Doctor <laughs> on stage. You're teaching me! <laughs> no, we respect all of our Reverend Doctors. A little, a little bit of a healthy anarchism is always welcome in these spaces. Um, and so um, we're going to have um, three young women who are going to be sharing a little bit about their work and their ministry. Um, and so I'm going to just share a brief word about them and invite them to come take their seat. Um, maybe you should do so as I, as I give these introductions. So I'm going to introduce all three speakers and then they are going to have the opportunity one by one, a strict 15 minutes. I know Habiba likes to start with dancing, um, and her 10 minute slot can quickly become 45 minutes, um, but that is something to celebrate. But we do need to stick the time as best as we can. So our first speaker will be Habiba Juma, and she is the founder. Yes. Wow. Where is she? She's not here. <laughs> She's here. Oh, here she is. Our first uh, speaker, Habiba, she is a founder, the founder, and executive director of Soraya, nurturing teen moms and females. As a dedicated 25 year old woman, Soraya proudly hails from Kibera, slum in Nairobi, Kenya a vibrant community that has profoundly shaped her commitment to fostering positive change with its confines. Growing up amidst the unique challenges faced by teenage moms, females, and young individuals in Kibera, she is passionately dedicated to empowering them through advocacy for education, the promotion of gender equality, and the advancement of economic opportunities. With proficiency in web design, she leverages technology to create meaningful impact. Deeply invested in transforming the lives of adolescent moms in Kibera, she focuses on advocacy, skill building, and ensuring their rights. The ultimate goal is to prevent early marriages and facilitate access to quality education, drawing inspiration from the resilient spirits of her community. Kibera Slum has instilled in Soraya a profound sense of responsibility and determination to contribute to its betterment. Enthusiastic about the potential to make a lasting difference, she is driven by the belief that change occurs one step at a time. Her journey is fueled by the resilient spirit and untapped potential of the remarkable individuals in Kibera. So our first speaker will be Habiba Juma. Then I will also introduce our other two uh, the second is Muna Nassar. Yes, he's coming. Uh, Muna Nassar is a Palestinian Christian woman from Bethlehem. She has been a long-term advocate for the justice of the Palestinian people through her education, her work, and her writings. She has previously worked as a project coordinator for Kairos Palestine. In 2021, Una obtained an MPhil degree in Intercultural Theology and Interreligious Studies from Trinity College, Dublin. She joined the World Communion of Reformed Churches in December 2022 as the Executive Secretary for Mission and Advocacy. Una is also a writer that aims through her work to articulate and bring together a narrative that represents the diversity of Palestine and Palestinians while highlighting the Palestinian's voice and agents. Then our third speaker will be Priyanka Sami. <laughs> uh, Priyanka is a Dalit feminist activist based in India. She is the youth convener of the National Federation of Dalit Women, the NFW, a grassroots network of Dalit women-led community-based organizations across India. Over a decade of engaging with the feminist and other social justice movements in India, Priyanka has been able to advance historically marginalized women's agency, voice, and leadership at the grassroots. Priyanka is a part of feminist, uh, part of feminist processes regionally and globally as well. From 2020 to 2023, Priyanka was one among the three national gender youth advocates from India's 
driving the UN Women's Generation Equality Campaign. She's also a board member, and uh, sorry, a board of director at Frida, F-R-I-D-A, the Young Feminist Fund, and a board member of the International Ballot Solidarity Network, which works at a global level to address caste-based discrimination. Bianca currently also serves as a guest practitioner, School of the State, University of London. So we warmly welcome you all to the stage, and we are all looking forward to hearing from each of you. I'm going to ask Habiba, if you can come share with us first. We welcome her. Hello. Hello. I hope you are all having a good time. I like doing activities to freshen up the room and uh, spike the, the, the energy. But uh, I was told I only have uh, 15 minutes, so I'm going to be as brief as uh, possible. Uh, so, once again, um, all protocol observed. Uh, my name is Habiba Juma, uh, the founder and the executive director of uh, Soraya, nurturing teen moms and female. It's a transformative community based organization in Kenya that operates uh, in slums. And uh, right now, we operate in uh, two slums, mainly uh, Kibera slums and uh, Malaria slums in Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, basically what we do, uh, basically what we do, we work with the teenage mothers who have dropped out of school either in primary level, high school level, or university level, and uh, they didn't get a media chance to proceed with the education. Some of them are forced into early marriage, and uh, some of them are even forced to start employment at a very uh, young age, which is so difficult to them. So we create a safe space for them to bring them together, to tap in into their inner trauma and try to heal, and also help them come out of their comfort zone by trying to give them a different type of skills and uh, that will be able to help them either run a business to provide for themselves, uh, to be able also to provide for their kids, or even uh, support some of them to go back to school to proceed with their education. Uh, in our program, uh, we, have, uh, we have three categories uh, which uh, we do um, work with uh, teenage moms and uh, we also do uh, preventive measures. For the preventive measures, the one that we work with uh, girls and uh, boys who are still in school. What we do with them, we take them through mentorship program to help them understand the importance of education and stay focused with their study and also help them understand the repercussions and consequences of getting pregnant before finishing school whereby they get uh, direct stories from the young teenage mothers who have experienced it. They share what they are, they are going through and they're able to see things in a different way, which also uh, helps uh, reduce the number of uh, teenage uh, pregnancy in the community. Uh, we also do community awareness activity. Right now we also work with uh, men, because um, uh, these girls are getting pregnant with the bike guys, uh, matatu guys, and um, some of them, when they give the girl, when they get the girl pregnant, they deny the pregnancy, and uh, the girl is forced to away from from home. And looking at the African culture, it's a it's a taboo. If you're a young girl if below 18, you get pregnant, and you still you're supposed to focus on your study. Most of the chances you just away from school. Our mission is to create a safe space. Uh, for the teen moms and women in our community to feel uh, they have the chance to build their, themselves and also tap into their power to make sure that they are growing and they're improving the, 
and their lives and the community. Uh, we envision a world with young girls and women with a self-purpose and a positive change. Uh, these are some of our core values. We believe in self-purpose, integrity, empathy, and compassion. These are some of the things that uh, we offer and uh, things that we offer to help the girls uh, and also help our community grow. We offer training on capacity building whereby we tackle um, areas like uh, sexual and maternal reproductive health, personal development, which is very key because when we get them or we onboard them to the training, they are they are not open-minded and uh, they, are, they, they have a lot of trauma, fear and everything. So we create a very safe space for them, talk to them, help them in, and, and also uh, help them see things on a different way so they can be able to, uh, to, they can be able to concentrate on the other intensive trainings that we offer to them. Uh, we also do parenting and nutrition for the babies uh, for the health of the babies, and we also do community awareness program whereby we work with religious uh, leaders and uh, we work with the community members to ensure that you're reducing cases of teenage pregnancy and gender equality. We also do mentorship whereby it's a social and relationship post pregnancy, maternal health, post pregnancy, and faith support. With faith support is when we bring uh, priests and chefs to the training, they talk to the girls, because uh, it's, uh, it's not only the issue that they are facing, they also need to, to come back to God and realize the way that they're supposed to be living um, in, a, in a good way which is um, acceptable and godly. That's why we work with the priests, and the uh, chefs uh, will bring them, they talk to them, and also create a more safe space for them to believe uh, uh, in themselves. Uh, we also do community empowerment program. This is one that helps also grow the community, which is digital literacy, entrepreneurship, professionalism, personal finance, and uh, art and craft, and photography and videography. Under art and craft, we give them tangible skills like baking, making soap, beading, tailoring, and among others. This is our achievements. Uh, this is our achievements for so far. <coughs> and uh, these are these achievements uh, we witnessed it immediately after training. We started this uh, program uh, in 2020 when Corona started and the first report was in 2021. And immediately after the training, uh, we had uh, 32 moms uh, in that uh, training, and uh, three of them, immediately after the training, their relationship with their parents improved, and they were even, uh, they were even accepted back home. And uh, also, immediately after that training, uh, two of them got employment opportunity, and the rest started business. In cohort two, which was 2022, uh, we worked with 18 months. Um, 50 of them were community women, and 30 of them were teen months under 18 years. And 19 of them immediately after training, we reported that um, all of all of the 19, their relationship with their parents improved, and uh, their parents were even able to support them and eight of them uh, started working in 2020. In 2023, uh, we worked also with a team mom, and you can see uh, this is 2023, whereby we did uh, the training in two locations. So earlier, we used to do 2021 in one location, and then 2022 in another location. Then the community members from the first location were requesting more of uh, our work and also they were requesting us to come and continue support the girls. So in 2023, we did two cohorts in two locations at the same time 
and we work with 60 demands, 30 from Madara Islam and 30 from Kibera Islam. And all of them, their parents came for the graduation, they supported them, and even their relationship and uh, um, the way they were reacting or relating with them was so different because they, they saw their girls are trying to do something to improve their lives. Right now, um, there's a current cohort right now that's uh, going on with the training. And uh, this is, uh, these are some of um, our participants' feedback. You can see the first girl, Marianne, she's from our first cohort. Her story is um, it's actually motivating, especially to me, because she gives me hope. Uh, when we started the training, um, she, she wanted to do a business when we were giving her uh, entrepreneurship skills. She wanted to, to start a business. She started selling mandazi. Uh, it's, a, it's a food made of uh, wheat flour. Then immediately after some few months while she was in the training, she added new thing in the business. Immediately after finishing the, the, the training, she started selling fish, ordering it from another county to Nairobi. And right now she has a hotel in Nairobi CBD, where she has also employed some of young people like her. And the second one down there group, uh, she's from the uh, she's from cohort uh, 2022. Uh, she also was passionate about business. Now she's uh, having her own product in her mother's uh, shop and they're doing the business together. The other one, Liz, is from last year's training. She located from one location to another, but she used to make sure that she's coming for training. And immediately after that, She's, she now has a business, and that's her hotel, Lizzy Classy Hotel. The next one is uh, Valerie, uh, Valentine. So Valentine is also from last year's training. Um, immediately after training, she opened up her business. You can see there, a push motor spare parts. Um, she sells spare parts for bikes. But um, recently when I was talking to her, uh, the baby daddy took over the business because he invested a lot of money in it compared to, to her. So they had to split. Now she's trying to venture in other things. These are our, our participants from last year's training. They won a gown. It was the first time for our, our organization. It, it was so nice. This is the one of the one of the examples from one location. And these are some of the job opportunities and uh, training that we took some of the beneficiaries who completed um, our program. So the first picture, some of the girls are doing tailoring with a partner organization. The other the other picture are some of the girls are doing um, dread they are making artificial dreadlocks. Uh, with another partner organization, and the third row, it's um, our girls, um, they are learning how to bake cake and make soap. Um, this is uh, our recent response on climate change that affected a lot of areas uh, in, our, in our country, especially the slum, and our response to that, we did, uh, we did, uh, um, we did, um, collect some clothes from friends and uh, from when wishers and we went to take the clothes to the affected demands in the different locations and also we partnered with the uh, Red Cross and did a food drive for them we gave them uh, a, a can for putting clean water and also some pack of food our next step which is this year and next year uh, we want to, to do a lot of uh, impact do uh, documentation and we welcome partners who would like to join us in working and do change and transforming life. And we also want to do a lot of team building for, to, to bring the community together and also address uh, different cases, i.e. teenage pregnancy. 
and that's depending on our reach. Also, we welcome anyone who has uh, more skills on uh, curriculum development to see to see into our curriculum and help it develop to fit the girls and also um, things that are required for the job. Um, our call to action. Um, I welcome anyone who'd like to sponsor the girls, anyone who'd like to sponsor a cohort with maternal fee, anyone who'd like to volunteer and, be, and share their skills with the girls, because I alone and my team we won't be able to do that. They can learn something from us, but I also believe they can learn something from all of you. And uh, I have a very short video. I want to play it so that you can see uh, the overview of Kibera and the life uh, the teenage moms are living in it. It's in Swahili. You'll read the translation.
Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Habiba, for that wonderful presentation and showing us the faces of these people who've been transformed by your excellent work. I'm going to ask our second speaker, Bruna, to come and share with us that, please. for Mahushan, for the invitation, and for the solidarity with the Palestinian people, and for asking me to speak about my own context uh, in Palestine as a Christian Palestinian. Um, so being born in Bethlehem, and I always felt a sense of pride to be born in uh, the same place that Jesus was born to be a part of the continuation of the Christian community in Palestine. However, growing up in Palestine and growing up in Bethlehem, I realized on such a young age that life looks different for us just because we are Palestinian. It was something that I grappled with and I'm still grappling with until this day. At the age of 10, and during the Second Intifada, I came to the realization that this isn't the life that a normal 10 years old would live in another part of the world. And looking at the images coming out of Gaza today, and looking at the generations of kids that have been brought up under siege, it is imperative to be reminded that this violence that Israel is unleashing on the Palestinian people isn't something new. This violence has been foundational to the establishment of the state of Israel. In 1984 and 1948, when Israel was established, and it has continued until this day. This violence has been necessitated for the continuation of the settler colonial project of Israel. I think it's important today, when we are hearing so much about Palestine in the news, to be reminded that this did not start in October. And October did not happen in a vacuum. It's crucial to be reminded that prior to October, Palestinians have been living under military occupation for the past 76 years. That Palestinians in Gaza have been living under siege for the past 16 years. They have been blocked by land, air, and sea. That generations and generations of Palestinians have been brought up <coughs> under a system that deems them as a problem, and that literally is taking their land, their livelihood away from them. Today, I think it's important for us to be reminded when we are hearing so much about Palestine, to really listen and to really discern on what's happening. So how do we talk about Palestine? And how do we talk about it when there is a general consensus about Palestine and the Palestinians that is continually dwindling, and when Palestinian lives seems to matter so little? In a time where we witness commentators and decision makers not even talk sensibly about issues of injustice and inequality in Palestine, but where politicians are outspokenly support sponsoring genocide and sponsoring the ethnic cleansing of the people. Where there is a live streamed Western sponsored genocide happening in front of our own eyes. More often than not, it feels like it is our responsibility to always educate and give our own Palestinian narrative to people who are still contemplating the question of Palestine. 
And while we have to live under the brunt reality of military occupation and oppression, they are still contemplating the question of Palestine. And while it is our duty to our cause as Palestinians to speak up, there is always some hesitance to adopt the Palestinian narrative. Today, what you witness in the West Bank, in Hebron, in Jerusalem, in Bethlehem, in Jenin, is an almost complete erasure of human rights. The rights of movement, the rights of ownerships of homes and land, the humiliation and degradation that Palestinians are witnessing today are so blunt and evident, one cannot believe they still exist in the 21st century. Today, the Israeli settlements in the West Bank are expanding by an alarming speed. Today, there is an 8 meters high separation wall that is constructed to be in completion all around the West Bank. Today, there is an increased level of hostility and attacks by Jewish Israeli colonizers on Palestinian lands and cities. Today in Gaza, there is more than 37,000 people who were murdered, more than 85,000 injured, hundreds of thousands displaced in Gaza. And for the past six months, seeing the images of children, dead and living, being pulled from under the rubble in Gaza, of people being operated on without anesthesia, of bodies torn, limbs from limbs, of babies removed from incubators and left to die, of bodies hanging from buildings, of mothers and fathers carrying pieces of their children in plastic bags. <coughs> One would wonder which will be the horror that will be deemed horrific enough for this to stop. One would get the impression that Palestinian lives, irrespective of their age, gender, religion, political alignment, is a threat to the existence of Israel. Those lives have been reduced to mere numbers and figures. They have been made into statistics. They didn't even get to be buried, to be grieved, to be named, <coughs> as there was no one left to mourn them. And that's why we Palestinians always feel compelled to document and to describe everything that is happening to us, big and small, to make sure people understand what is at stake. We want to say, but this was a child, and she was a mother, and he was a great father, not a thing bound to die a gruesome death in a devastated city, but a child who would have grown by the sea with a loving family. The genocide unfolding before our eyes in Gaza proved to be like a magnifying glass, showcasing the empire's tool and machinery. Using secular colonialism along with colonial Christian heritage, all wrapped up within a stereotypical racist projection of brown and black bodies. It has supplied Israel with all the toolkit that is only permitted on the other. Out of the horrific attest of humanity that Gaza has unfolded of the world, it has also shown what dissenting, resisting means. It showcased that the cries, the resistance, and the hope of people who seek life, livelihood, who seek to stay in their land to enjoy their freedom by multiple means, are seen as problematic and are seen as uncivilized, are seen as barbaric, <coughs> or even are seen as terrorists. They are reduced to rubble by lethal weapons and made invisible by the software that deems them as the other, and deems them as the stranger of their land. The software that presents some lives to be grievable, 
while others are not. Palestinian lives and voices and existence is considered a threat to the Israeli settler colonial existence. And therefore, how can one talk about life flourishing community when there is a Western funded, ideologically supported, theologically operated system that delegitimizes and problematizes the Palestinian people and translated into the annihilation of complete bloodlines, of complete city, of churches, of hospitals, of mosques, of homes and lands. Cities that had history and had cultures and had rights, full of stories and full of wanting to live and to remain on the land. In it all, Christian theology has played a role in almost all settler colonial projects. In South Africa, in North America, in Australia. So settler colonialism has shown its, its faces in many contexts around the world, and Palestine is no exception. However, what is happening in Palestine, using the Bible, is an exception. The Bible, many Christians uh, have been using the Bible and weaponizing the Bible to justify the occupation and the military occupation of Palestine and of the Palestinian people. Using Christian Zionism to do that for the past 200 years? And if we as Christians are not outraged by this genocide, by the weaponizing of the Bible to justify it, by the militarizing of Christianity, then there is something deeply rooted, deeply wrong with our Christian witness. And it is really compromising the credibility of the gospel. So going back to what does life affirming communities look like in the Palestinian context? I think the Palestinian people over the decades, since the Nakba in 1948, since the Nakba in 1967, witnessing and surviving the first and the second Intifada, the multiple wars on Gaza, and the current genocide in Gaza, it has produced and has sustained the Palestinian people with the rootedness of the land. So I think when we talk about life flourishing communities, we should talk about uh, sumud as a concept for the Palestinian people. So sumud is an Arabic word that translates into perseverance and uh, resilience. And I think it is something to the <coughs> Palestinian because it really resembles and it really uh, defines the Palestinians through their rootedness on the land and through their rootedness on this land, because this land really is not only a geographical location for the Palestinian people. It's a land where they understand themselves through being on the land, through building their life on this land, through being connected on this land. So it's a school that has been anchored in the stride of the Palestinian people to a cause of justice and to a historical rootedness in this land. This rootedness uh, has seen sufferings and the persecution of the Palestinian people, but it also continues to propel a sense of steadfastness towards achieving hope for people on this land. And through their rootedness, their loving life culture, it's through this belief that one really has hope and has faith that we will be able to build a life flourishing community on this line, aside from all this suffering, but we will be able to build a life flourishing community on the Palestinian land. Thank you. Una, for such a powerful presentation um, and so moving uh, for us. If we are not outraged by this genocide, she said, then we are compromised by our witness to the gospel. May we hear that challenge and may we respond in faith to what we've heard this morning. Um, we're now going to have our third speaker, Priyanka, 
We welcome you to the stage. Hello, everyone. I'm a grassroots activist, and we don't start anything without a slogan. So the slogan is, break the silence, end the violence. So I will say, break the silence, and you all will say, end the violence. Are you with me? Yes. In solidarity with the people of Palestine, break the silence, end the violence. Break the silence, end the violence. Break the silence, end the violence. Thank you. JB, at the outset, I would like to thank the Council of World Mission for inviting me to this beautiful assembly in Durban. I'm absolutely delighted and honored to be here with you today. Today, I've been asked to discuss life flourishing communities from the, from the lens of the Dalit communities across South Asia. Let me tell you a story. In 19... Let me begin by telling you a story. In 1929, in a village in South India, a girl baby was born to a young Hindu Dalit couple. Immediately after her birth, her parents took her outside and rolled her in a heap of garbage. They rolled the baby in a heap of garbage. This act conveyed to the gods their displeasure at not having been blessed with a baby boy. The girl was named Kupama, which literally translates from Tamil to English as woman born to garbage. And she was my maternal grandmother. Now, another story from the recent past in India. A young Dalit woman in the northern state of Uttar Pradesh succumbed to her injuries after being gang raped. The 19 year old family say the police cremated her remains in the middle of the night without the family's consent or knowledge. This seemingly unconnected events separated by a near century and more than 2,000 kilometers apart in India in a nutshell, tells you what it means to be born a Dalit woman in India. Our bodies, our dignity, our rights continue to be unabashedly betrayed in life and death. Sisters and brothers, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the caste system, let me tell you about it. The caste system is 3,000 years old. Yes, you heard that right, 3,000 years old. Making it the longest surviving social hierarchy in the world. Dalits, known as untouchables or outcasts, are those who fall outside the rigid stratification of the Hindu social order. Let's look at this diagram. This provides a simplified view of the caste system, which is a hierarchical structure deeply embedded in the South Asian culture. At the top of this pyramid are the Brahmins, who have historically been priests and scholars, enjoying the most privileges and respect in Hindu society. Just below are the Kshatriyas, who are the warrior and ruler class, followed by the Vaishyas, who are merchants and landowners. Near the base are the Shudras, typically peasants and laborers. These four main groups are part of the system which, one, which determines one's caste, their occupation and social status in society. Now, below the pyramid, please focus on below the pyramid are two groups that are most marginalized. The Adivasis are the indigenous tribes who often struggle till date to protect their land and cultural rights. And the Dalits are known as the untouchables, 
are those who face discrimination and are relegated to the lowest social status, performing jobs considered impure. Now, the caste system essentially sanctions the denial of human rights and dignity to the Dalit community. So today, I'm going to focus on the Dalits. They are 270 million worldwide, 80 million of whom are women. Caste-based discrimination stems from the social cultural beliefs that label the community as unclean, impure, and polluted. That is, even today, even as we speak, are forced to do dehumanizing work such as manual scavenging. A lot of you outside South Asia may not understand what manual scavenging is. It is to clean human waste, to clean human excreta by hands, manually. The brutal practice strips that it's of dignity, trapping them in a cycle of poverty and severe discrimination. This is nothing short of modern day slavery, ladies and gentlemen. Dalits are seen as so impure that even our shadows, shadows are believed to pollute those belonging to higher castes. In rural India and rural villages across South Asia, Brahmins would immediately, Brahmins are the priestly class if you remember from the previous slide, Brahmins would immediately cleanse themselves with water if a Dalit shadow is cast on them. Yes. Our mere shadows can pollute them. So caste manifests in many guises and to varying degrees, depending on the context, from manual scavenging to Dalit girls being forced into prostitution in temples known as the Devadasi system. That is a little girl less than 10 years old being offered as a prostitute to the priest in the temple, to the Brahmin priest in the temple. And this continues till date, brothers and sisters. So caste induced power structures. Caste induced power structures are not just confined to operating within social institutions alone, but influence every aspect of society and every aspect of life. From the political economy, it informs markets, businesses, all socio-cultural, economic, and political institutions till date. So this deep-rooted stigma perpetuates severe political and social exclusion and untouchability. Despite 75 odd years of constitutional <coughs> safeguards and equality before law across, across South Asian countries, Dalits remain at the bottom of the social ladder and face caste-based discrimination in varying degrees in their everyday lives. The practice of caste, this is very important to note, the practice of caste is widely pervasive, not only in South Asia, brothers and sisters, but it is pervasive across the globe through the South Asian diaspora. Therefore, it is a global issue. It is just not an issue of South Asia. Dalits have been long arguing that caste is a basis for discrimination on par with racism and anarchy. Both the practices of racism and casteism operate on the premise of purity and exclusion. I will say that again. Both the practices of racism and casteism operate on the premise of purity and exclusion. Therefore, parallels have been drawn on the similar struggles of the blacks and the Dalits and the need to decolonize and de brahmanize social structures even, even when Dalits convert from Hinduism to Christianity to escape caste-based discrimination, we often find their caste identity persists, imparting, Im impacting their social standing. Even within our churches, I want you to hear this, even within our churches, caste 
This caste-based prejudice manifests in various aspects of church life, from social interactions to leadership roles, perpetuating a social hierarchy within our churches. Most often, people from the upper caste, the privileged classes, occupy influential and decision-making positions within our churches across South Asia. For instance, although more than 80% of our people in our churches are Dalits, the leadership roles are appropriated by the 20% who belong to historically dominant castes. Right? So our churches are patriarchal and casteist institutions. Our churches are not egalitarian by any measure. Therefore, Dalits have been advocating with socio-economic, political and religious institutions, including our churches, locally, regionally and globally, to recognize caste-based discrimination as a global issue on par with racism, ethnicity, gender, among others. And I absolutely cannot leave this assembly without flagging this critical issue. The caste system as the world's most enduring social stratification model casts a long <coughs> shadow on other forms of oppression from racism to settler colonialism. The caste system's blueprint of segregation and hierarchy have uncanny resemblance and parallels in the mechanisms of oppression observed globally today. We live in times where struggles for social justice and equity converge, revealing inherent similarities between issues. For instance, the Dalit and the Palestinian cause, through our, though our realities may be distinct, they are deeply interconnected within the same fabric of resistance against targeted systemic and intergenerational oppression. Dalit women 
are raped every day. But I promise you, this is a conservative estimate. Across South Asia, rape and other forms of sexual violence are used against that women to dehumanize just not the woman but the entire community to show a Dalit and to show the Dalit community that you are dirty, you are unclean, you are impure, you deserve this, you deserve nothing better, you have no human rights. The state and the church have failed to protect Dalit women's rights and dignity which enable the continuance of this targeted violence. Therefore, the focus of our work at the National Federation of Dalit Women is to address caste and gender-based violence and atrocities. We provide psychosocial support and legal support to survivors of violence. At the grassroots in the communities, we heavily invest in developing and strengthening boys' agency and leadership skills of Dalit women and girls. They're so marginalized that they do not get adequate opportunities or spaces to voice their opinions, their challenges, and their lived realities. Therefore, facilitating spaces for their active engagement and capacity strengthening efforts is our primary goal. And in our pursuit to leave no one behind, we prioritize community development, mentorship programs, skill development training, that support Dalit women and girls in a way that brings about transformational changes in their lives. We also work with Dalit youth who are an extremely vulnerable constituency. Despite affirmative action across <coughs> South Asia, Dalit youth continue to struggle with access to basic services, especially education. And these challenges related to education are rooted in an historical legacy where Dalits were systematically denied educational opportunities for centuries. Remember, we're talking about a 3,000-year-old system. Therefore, we work towards facilitating higher education for youth from our community. We believe in promoting transformational education as, as it creates access to improved and more dignified livelihood options and contributes to building social, economic, political, and cultural capital that the Dalits have been denied for centuries. You know, at the National Federation of Dalit Women, we run a campaign called Pass the Mic, literally, Pass the Mic, where we bolster the agency of young Dalit women, where we encourage and empower them to be at the forefront of all community efforts. We believe it is critical for Dalits to set and drive the agenda. We at the National Federation of Dalit Women believe in the agency and power of Dalit women to lead and transform their communities. We have learned on our feet to organize not just locally or nationally, but also transnationally to create, to consult, to collaborate with stakeholders across the spectrum. Building solidarity with other oppressed communities and engaging with the international community such as this has given us a place, has given us struggles to eliminate caste-based discrimination a place in the global justice movement. These international platforms to collectively assert and validate our struggles has been supremely useful in visibilizing our issues. Despite the backlash we face while doing our work at the local level, at the national level, and at the global level, especially from our governments, we continue to face, we continue to fight back because we believe the emerging social capital of Dalit women has the potential to change status quo. So I will conclude by suggesting a few things for the church. My humble submission to this August House is that our transformation, their solidarity and action is very, very critical. It is an urgent call for churches to move from tokenistic solidarities to transformational solidarities. I will say that again. We need to move from tokenistic solidarities to transformational solidarities and action. This transformational 
solidarity must be unapologetically rooted in the principle of intersectionality. This will ensure that the agendas and missions are not just representative, uh, representative of historically marginalized communities, but are led by them. The underlying understanding behind the strategy is those who live through oppression have the most vital insights into their conditions and the most compelling visions for their liberation. Amen. Yes. I would also like to call upon our churches to lead the advocacy for reparations. Churches must advocate for government reparations and reparations from other stakeholders to address the enduring impact of systemic oppression on historically marginalized communities. Churches, by leveraging their influential platforms, network, and resources, can push for policies that provide economic restitution, access to quality education, and help fair housing opportunities, among others. Through such advocacy, churches can help bridge and gap the and, and bridge the gap between marginalized communities and achieve social equity. Long-term policies and institutional change, churches must move beyond just service provision to basic services to focusing on changing hegemonic colonial and casteist practices through inclusive policies and structures. Most often we see churches having a Christmas outreach where they will provide 100 bags and 100 toys in their outreach programs. This one-off and these very small gestures for the church is not going to address a system that is 3,000 years old, be it caste or patriarchy. And of course, resources and support be my last point. If you are committed as unified churches to challenging status quo, then you have to put your money where your mouth is. Thank you. hierarchies and build life flourishing communities for all. Um, we're going to take a little bit of time now to um, just process some of what we've heard at, at our tables. Um, I'm going to give us until 11.35 because then we want to field our questions to our speakers and we'll have about 10 minutes to do so. So make sure that you keep your questions, your comments as brief as possible so that we have enough time to discuss these things. So we have until 11.35 before we will um, come to life for our question. Rise to life, life everlasting.